All right. Hello. It is on Parade, the Too Ugly for TV podcast, bonus podcast, vodcast. It's the video version, although we I do cut this down to audio and release that as well. Uh, with me, as always, is a musician in New York City, Barrett Ansar Goodwin. Hello, Barrett. And joining us, I'm Nathan Timmel, comedian in Iowa City. And joining the two of us is a comedian in the Boston area, Andrew Hall. Hello, Andrew. I want to keep my waving within frame here. So I'm just yeah. going to do the small, <laughs> maybe the Queen's wave. I don't know. Maybe I'll do that. That's a good one, yeah. Andrew, or as your thing says, Andy. So I, I've known you as Andrew. We talked about that a, a little last week. Wait, yeah. wait a second. What, what, if you watch us regularly, what do you mean you talked about it last week? Well, this is our second conversation. See, last week, uh, Barrett, Andrew, and I all had a nice conversation. And when it was over, um, due to technical difficulties and human stupidity, mine, uh, it didn't record. So this is take two, basically. We're going to try and recapture the magic, um, kind of like how, you know, Godfather 3 recaptured the magic of Godfather 1. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, <laughs> spirituality, religion, belief uh. process. And to begin, we will do exactly what we did last week since nobody saw it, is we'll quick go around and tell those listening, even though it, last week it was an introduction because Antar doesn't know Andrew and I know both of you. So we were, we were all getting on the same page. We're kind of there now, but it would be kind of awkward for us to just jump in without anyone else knowing where we are. So um, we'll just give a quick summation of who we are in our and where we are in our belief system. And I'll go first since I'm the asshole talking. Um, what did I say last week? I said I'm I'm uh, mellow, confused. Like I used to be. That that's exactly what I said. As I used to be young and angry. Why the fuck would anyone believe in religion? This is so stupid. I've, book written by goat herders that didn't know where the sun went at night. How did they know truth? <laughs> and now I'm old and I'm, I, I kind of, I, I kind of feel X files about it. Like part of me, I want to believe, but I just can't because I think it's just sort of absurd. Um, I've done a year study of the Bible. I, in college, I studied Buddhism. I, I think parts of every religion I've ever studied are kind of neat but as an overall truth, I, I don't find any man-made religion, and and they're all man-made, all of them, to, to be, like, I, if someone really wanted to sit down and explain to me the difference between Scientology and Christianity, they could try, but to me, just because Christianity was made up before Scientology, like, you can trace Scientology to its origins because it's so recent, that doesn't make it any more valid than Christianity, which has a lot of flaws and a lot of borrowing and stealing from what became before. So I, that, that's me in, 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 in a whole is, is I used to be angry. Now I'm more forgiving, but I'm still confused. Um, who would like to go next? I will go next. There we go. So <laughs> I'm going to film, I'm going to fill that pregnant pause. So. Yeah. <laughs> before I start, I just want to advocate being angry. <laughs> you made a comment last week that uh, Barrett quite oh. enjoyed. Uh, you, I think you said anger is your superpower. It is my superpower. <laughs> it is my gift. I want to spread it around like chunky peanut butter. That's what I want to do. Um, yeah. So, so I'm an atheist. I uh, I don't believe in God. Uh, I am an agnostic atheist in the fact that I don't see any evidence for God, any good evidence. So. Why would I believe in anything that there isn't good evidence for? Is there a small, small, small possibility that a deity exists? Sure there is. But there's also a small, small possibility of a lot of things existing, which I just don't have the time to believe in or the desire. And there's no money in it to believe in <laughs> things that may not really exist. Actually, I would, I would argue with you there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 my position. All yeah, right. but, but let's clarify. Are you, I believe, and then I guess fact check this from our last episode. Uh, I believe you said you are an the last episode no atheist. one should go looking for since it doesn't exist. Activist. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm definitely okay. um, an activist. I, I okay, blog. So can you explain I, what that means to the, sure. to the people? I think 
that what I do is that with my comedy, I run a comedy blog, Laughing in Disbelief, which is on the Pathios family of blogs. Oh, I just also, that. Thanks for bringing it up. Sure. I also run a YouTube channel with the same name, uh, Laughing in Disbelief. So what I do is make fun of religious bullies. Let's say typically white evangelicals, which happen to have their noses up Trump's butt, for lack of a better way of putting it, people who wish to turn the United States of America into a Christian theocracy, those are people who are typically my targets for my comedy. Mm -hmm. And on my YouTube channel, you know, I, I have scientists come in and we talk about things like I had a, a biologist come on and we talked about the evolution of human morality, about how we inherit a lot of our predispositions, our moral predispositions from primates, from other primates, for an example. And other times I just have comedians come on and we just talk about fun stuff. So were you- well, before, and, you before you ask a yeah. question, would you clarify your stance, Barrett? And okay. then, then we will jump to- All right. So give, give everyone a- where yeah, let, let me, uh, let me, I'll do this. I'll ask my question so I don't forget it because I tend to forget things and they happen in less than like 10 seconds later. Uh, my question is really, do you, did you become an activist pre-Trump or post-Trump? And if so, why? But you can, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think and then, you know, we'll hear your answer. So yep. I, I'm much like Nathan. I am um, black. Exactly. Oh, wait. <laughs> I was born, I was born a poor, I was born a poor <laughs> black child. <laughs> um, I, uh, I got that. I, I, I deeply would love to believe. Like, it, nothing would make me happier, truthfully, than to be a believer. You know what I mean? Um, no. Do you think there's something lacking in you now that belief would fill that hole with, like, cock or well, putty? Or? How to say this without sounding, uh, sounding obnoxious? It would give me a nice escape clause for a bunch of stuff <laughs> I don't actually want to have to worry about figuring out on my own because the problems <laughs> are so massive that I, I think they're beyond any one person's capacity to figure out. And if I could just put that all on somebody else, that would make me happy to a certain degree. There'd be a sense of, like, relief if I knew that, like, there was a God in heaven and, you know, what right. I did. Here. I didn't have to work you know, hard. I just prayed better or more often. Well, even if I had to work hard, just that I knew that it was going to be guaranteed. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it wasn't a gamble, you know? Right. But right. It would be like having an insurance policy. Right, exactly. Right. Oh, and exactly. so to a certain degree, but, but, but also in another sense, like, I mean, I've read... I find that like if you read the Gnostic writings, if you read the Sufi stuff, and if you read like the the um, the Kabbalah and things like that, right? You read the upper echelons of the big three desert cults. You know, you find the same thing, right? Knowledge of God through knowledge of self, and it really seems to be about something really good, right? at a certain level when you get way up to the top of the stuff. And I find that stuff beautiful. The idea of devotion, like as a musician, when you're in the zone and you're playing or you're doing something, that feeling is, feels like divinity. It feels like yeah. magic to me. You know what I mean? And Can so- Can I interrupt you just to be, clarify? Yeah, it doesn't even take music out of it, just performance. Cause I, I felt right. that sure. Absolutely. having Absolutely. this moment with an audience where it's just like you yeah. feel the writers and musicians sometimes say that they didn't write the the, the, the book or the song, or whether it was God flowing through them. And right. I've felt that. I have felt on stage, Absolutely. like I'm kind of outside of myself and I'm right. just talking and making well, a connection. Yeah. That, that's, right. a, that, that, that's a characteristic of being in what's called a, a flow, a peak flow state. Well, a flow right? state. Right. right. A flow state. So, so that you're right. just, you lose, you lose a certain sense of self and you're just totally emerged or submerged. Yes. In, in, in and and does that, I'm having a thought, does that necessarily have to be put on God? Because wouldn't it in reality just be a moment of holy shit, I have 
gotten away from my own ego for a moment because for 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 the uh, every other waking moment of my life it's me 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 or i'm doing you know th this is a moment of of having a connection where you, you st i mean i'm sure there are people that do look at it as an ego like dig me on stage but i look at it as like maybe my ego has gotten the fuck out of the way for just this brief period and i am experiencing oneness i have no idea i mean I'm it saying. seems that though but again like the upper echelons of many of the religions, at least the big three desert cults, that's what they say. Like, it, that's what they're trying to get everybody to do at their highest level. Does that mean there's a God? No. Right? It just means I mean, they're 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 up, they're, that they're Right, but because, I mean, like, the, the idea, I suppose the question is, is there a difference between religion and God? Right? Like, if the... Because to a degree, if I think about what you're talking about, right, if you can get to that flow state through bowling, through running, through praying and meditating, if there's a million different ways to get there and religion is one way that people get to that flow state, is that somehow negative? Hmm. You know well, I, 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 I want to back up and unpack a couple of things. One, there there yes. are non theists There's still the question about when you right. an activist yes. Trump. So, so, so I will You've say that there, there have definitely been non-theistic religions. There have been religions with no God or gods in them, certain strands of right. Buddhism. Like Buddhism, right. Right, right. exactly. Uh, the Satanic Temple, which is relatively a new yeah. religion, they mm -hmm. are definitely a non-theistic religion. So yeah, you can. So wait a minute, the satanic temple, temple, right. which is different from the satanic which, church. It's a long so story. How, you, you don't want to unpack it. <laughs> okay, Be, but they they, they like yeah, Satan yeah, they, and God are intimately connected to each other. Well, yeah, also, it, it did from, and I've had this discussion a million times. <laughs> The satanic temple has like really good tenets and and really good belief systems. And when I look at them, I go, wow, this is all really solid stuff. You just have that enormous roadblock of putting Satan in your name that's going to turn everybody off. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm like, you have such good ideas, and so many people are just going to go, eh, that, that yeah. Satan can't it's pass it's that. So many things to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to my act to the question that you just that you asked yeah. me before we started is that uh, how I became an activist. And I became an activist. I was already an atheist, but I became an activist once my son was born uh, about 18 years ago. And because you notice when people do have children, they typically have this, this need to figure out what they're about, who they are in the world, to really kind of drill down and to figure things out. And so a lot of people at that time become more religious. At least this is what I've seen. People who have kids, it's like, well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna outsource a lot of this stuff and just return to my religious roots, maybe. You know, especially mm -hmm. when they're trying to bring a kid up. For me, I decided to explore a lot more about uh, humanism, and humanism is an atheistic idea: is that we only have ourselves, and we have to take care of each other. And when I saw the state of the country 15 years ago. It, start, it started worrying me because, you know, I'm a guy of a certain age, and I feel that since I was a wee nip of a lad that this kind of Christian evangelical uh, fundamentalism is on the march, has been on the march, and I've seen it take over the Republican Party or has slowly eaten away at the Republican Party. And, and like I said, about 15 years ago, I became more and more alarmed at the erosion of the wall between church and state. Once Trump became elected, I was pretty much like Elizabeth Warren when you see when she saw Mike Bloomberg on the stage. She basically said, "Hold my beer while I attack <laughs> Mike Bloomberg with all of my time and all of my heart." Once Trump became president, I saw him as a manifestation of of all my concerns that I had. And I'm like, well, I'm going to focus uh, at least 99% of my comedy and my time attacking the idea about Trumpism, attacking his his uh, religious allies, and just just like 
uh, vomiting up as much satirical pieces as I can to to do what I can to to speak truth to power. Basically, that's yeah. So so when Trump became elected, as Nathan can tell you, Nathan was on my old show, the Naked Diner podcast, and I'm sure we had discussions back in 2016, early 2000, you know, early 2016 during the primaries that I thought Trump was going to win. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's been very disturbing for me, for the, as most of us, for the last four or five years. Uh, so, so I felt like I had to do some kind of, had to kick my game up into a higher gear. What is it about the evangelicals? I can only answer for me, and I'm going to I guess suspect that it is possibly the same for you um, that that you find so offensive, especially when mis mixing with politics. Aside from the blanket, you know, like separation of church and state. With me, it is the blanket hypocrisy. The yeah. the the outright here are the teachings of Jesus, and everything we do seems to go against those teachings yeah. without any sense of irony without any sense of decency, moral, morality. It's, um, I, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. I do remember these people insulting the shit out of Barack Obama and Michelle yeah. Obama and, and making fun of her and her looks and then turning right around and saying, well, I wouldn't Melania appear naked. She's a beautiful woman. Well, you know, right, you right. forgive people when they get divorced uh, two times and land on their third wife. Like we forgive Newt Gingrich for divorcing his wife when she had cancer. And well, if he had to, you know, fuck a porn star and pay her off while his wife was at home with her newborn child. And like the, the, <laughs> the, the, the logistical uh, hoops they jump through to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, I'm, I'm struggling for a word, not verify their point, but to to not even make their point, to to struggle to not even define their point. I can't even think of the word, to, to try and uphold it as being true, of saying yeah. this is the true stance and here's everything we have to do to still yeah. try and hold it. It it That is what offends me, is that there there is no moral high ground they can sit on. Yeah. And yet they rest upon it. What, what scares and frightens me is that they want to turn the United States of America into Saudi Arabia or Iran, except, yeah. you know, it's their brand the of hypocritical Christianity. What's that? They want The Handmaid's Tale to be a documentary. Yeah, <laughs> in, in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, if, if, you know, when I was saying this, like, you know, four or five years ago, you know, I got a lot of, you know, people from people within the movement, people from within the atheist movement have known for a while what that side wants to do and what they are capable of doing and what they will do, you know, if given the chance. So yeah, Saudi Arabia, they want to turn us into Saudi Arabia and Iran, Pakistan, one of those type of countries. They are innately anti-democratic. They are innately pro-fascist. That's what Trump supporters, white evangelicals, the that set, that toxic brand of Christianity is all about. But I mean, I mean, I agree with you because I think that fundamentally we talk about people being radicalized in Islam, and I think they get radicalized in the evangelical church, right? Definitely. I think that those kids straight up get radicalized and and trained in how to be little terrorists, right? Oh yeah. Uh, so I agree with you one hundred percent. My question is this: I don't think religion is the problem. I don't think I think it, it's. I think that with I think religion is religion does what it does. It's a binding agent, right? It's oh, a binding that. agent that allows people to to work together and seamlessly spread an idea. It seems you know what I mean. Religion, it's like a larger version of the flat Earth society. Right. People think alike. Like, oh, we're just gonna have this right. idea and take and run with yeah. it. Religion. If you if you consider to be religion and believing things that aren't true, or or believing in things that can't be proven, as soon as you start disassociating yourself from how do I know what I believe is real, then you're starting to get into some dangerous territory. The, yeah, you're starting to get into some dangerous territory. I mean, and, and the thing is, it's like I wouldn't even say that religion is a binding. Now, now I would say in some situations, religion does 
does bind. I mean, it's it's evolutionarily useful in that way, right? But it's also an accelerant. It is like gasoline <laughs> on crazy. It's it's like a big, big <laughs> gallon of just on crazy. And you just see it. You just see it. You just got to look on the news for like five seconds. Right. But, I mean, but, yeah. Because I, I, I find uh, that I do this all too often. So uh, no, no, uh, no, including the two of you in my next statement. I find it very easy and, and I'm very quick to insult religion and say it's dumb and and just be confused by it. However, um, I do stumble like I when I donate to the local food pantry, I go to a church. There there is no other food pantry. It is a place of worship that says, "Hey, we have people in need our community." So they, you know, just develop the food pantry. Yeah. There, there was no one else doing it, so they took it upon themselves. So when I donate food to the food pantry, um, I, I take it to a church. Um, and on the flip side, you, you read about churches in San Francisco that put uh, uh, spikes on the ground so that uh, homeless people can't sleep on the church. But anyway, but uh, I, I, sent, I sent the two of you an article like every so often I'm reminded, hey, uh, judgmental asshole, remember that there are two sides to every story. And there there is an organization right now of Christians in Florida who are banding together to take a stand against Trump saying what I said earlier. He in no way represents the teachings of Jesus. He is not a moral man, and he does not represent the teaching, the what we believe in Christ and in love and, and in compassion. And they're going to try and get out the vote among their own community, among evangelicals, and, and say, look, if you can't vote for Biden, who has been a good Catholic man his entire mm -hmm. life, then don't vote or write in whoever you have to, but you cannot vote for this man. And I go, yeah, okay. Why can't more of them be like this? Why, why? I mean, you say it's pouring gasoline on the crazy. But, there can be good in there. Is I, Well, you know, what do you think? You know, this is what helped me understand Christianity better is I was reading through a book by John Loftus. He, he is an atheist now, but he was a preacher at one time. And he talks about Christianity as being plural, as Christianities, because there's so many different flavors of, of different Christians, right? There are some Christians who believe in the Trinity. There are Christians who don't believe in the Trinity. You know, if you include Mormonism as Christian, then that's a whole set of other beliefs that don't have a lot of things in common with other flavors of Christianity. And this is something, I'll let you continue in a second, this is something we did talk about last week on the aborted episode, where I admit in my ignorance that I don't know the difference between Catholics, Christians, Baptists, um, Protestants. Yeah. I don't I don't understand the difference between any of them. And people have explained it, but I so your your author, continue. I, I apologize. So so when I think about about Christian communities or Christian philosophies, I, I try not to think of them as a monolithic group, just like with Islam or Buddhism, or, you know, it's, it's, or even, even with atheists, there are many flavors of atheist communities out there. So, so I try to think about Christianity as, as Christianity is plural. So I try not to sweet, you know, paint everyone with such a wide brush. Uh, I like that because that if I if I that is a teaching moment for me, but because if I can keep that in my mind, then maybe I will in the future be less of a judgmental asshole when it comes to religion, where I'm just immediately like, oh, geez, goddamn Christ, you know, like why? Right, 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 right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th I actually really appreciate you saying that because. I think it's one of the things that, like, it, it, it keeps us, like, I think we have a tendency to look at people as monolithic groups, white people, black people, Muslims, Christians, the, you know what I mean? We say Native Americans as if there's one type of Native American, do you know what I mean? And it's like, right, like, I, so it's true that there are many different branches of Christianity and, they, and some of them have real strong problems with what other ones do, right? Oh, yeah. So I agree with that 100%, and I appreciate that. But I will say this. If we take a country that is kind of founded on a handful of really, like there's real like load-bearing fictions in this country, right? There's like I like that, load-bearing <laughs> fictions. That's, that's fascinating. That's great. <laughs> 
and it's like it's not my terms. It's uh, okay. All right, steal it. Eric Weinstein said it. I think that's why. That's why I stole it from. So okay. I don't know where he's in relation to Harvey. What well, the possibly? <laughs> but uh, but it's true. Like I feel like if you have a country that is built on these real pillars of just like falsehoods, how do you have a thing that? Like, it feels like we're primed for religion. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're, we're kind of primed for that kind of thing because we have so many fundamental beliefs that are just so clearly faulty. Do you know what we, I mean? we, we as a species are primed for religion when life is yes. miserable. When, when right. life is miserable around us, there is a, yeah. a, a, a really pretty straightforward correlation with the more miserable society is, the more religious it tends to be. That's oh, why absolutely. That's why Mississippi is more religious than maybe Vermont, for an example. The wow. standard of living is higher in Vermont, higher education levels, better, better health care. Now yeah. I'm having two thoughts uh, because you just reminded me of another one and uh, <laughs> slipping away, fuck. Okay, uh, first thought is the, the foundation of lies that, that Bear is talking about, doesn't religion didn't that start it? Because wasn't it religion that said, hey, uh, black people, you're not worthy, so you're going to be slaves, and hey, Indians, get off our land? Wasn't that I mean, religious doctrine? Was it religion that said that, or was it people saying that religion said that? Like, I don't know. know. Here, here's here know. what I thought. Um, off what Andrew just said, which is, I can't remember where I heard this. I can't remember where I read it. But it, it, it talked about the two different styles of religion, the, the book I read or the whatever, the podcast. And one style was a very punishing God that said, if you do this, then this is going to happen. And then the other style was a very forgiving God that said, OK, if you do this, we are all flawed. Let's let's try and do better. And it talked about how the different societies raised in those religions would act and react to stimulus. Because if you have a punishing, vengeful God, you're, you're going to be flinchy and you're going to be angry and you are going to be judgmental because you feel judged the entire time. And if you have a peaceful, benevolent God, mm. then you are going to be forgiving because, hey, it's okay what I just said. We are all flawed and God forgives us and God loves us. So just do better. And I, I, I wish I knew the source of that because I would love to read it again or give a more intelligent, concise breakdown. But that's the yeah. open is when it comes to so what you said about here's an interesting question in your experience in both of your experiences what groups of people tend to have a vengeful god taught to them in this country and what kind of people have a kinder gentler forgiving god taught to them i i would say that the the you know it, it sounds like circular logic but or a circular argument but gosh liberal people who come from blue states with once again higher education, higher standard of living, they feel safer, typically have a God who's pretty cool, who is pretty <laughs> forgiving. Uh, my ex-wife, she went to a church, she grew up in a church, and at no point she was talking about were they talking about hell. And I am from uh well, I'm from a hard city. And we talked about hell quite a bit, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, really? It's like really so you can expand on that so that societies that have a rougher time there is a tendency to create a rougher god is that to keep the people behaving and What's you that? need that is that to keep the people behaving right like you know like black people there was a lot of talk of satan in our, in, in black church growing up like yeah. satan as like a real person Sure. Like a, a real character, but not in a sense that Satan is going to damn you and, and stab you with a pitchfork in the ass for the rest of your life. More that Satan is going to come into your life if you're not vigilant and pull you down to the dark side. Like Satan was essentially Darth Vader. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah. He's going to use his, his powers to ruin your life and bring you over to this other side. You know what I mean? And that's how Satan was taught. It wasn't like a vengeful God. God was all forgiving and Jesus was all forgiving and understanding, but the devil was the, was going to pull you into this I, if I, you were not vigilant. You know I, what I, I mean? You know, the first thought that comes to my head is that a lot of liberal Christianity in this country is a reflection of white privilege. 
<laughs> Explain, uh, please. Because because <laughs> because you see a lot of liberal, you know, a lot of Christians, right? Like the UU Church people, they are from affluent areas. The more affluent the area, typically the more kind of kicked back, easygoing God there is. Um, <laughs> and and you know, if as as soon as you understand, as soon as people understand how how race and money work in this country and have worked historically in this country, then you can say as, at a certain point that, yeah, maybe liberal uh, pot smoking Jesus is a reflection and his followers are somewhat of a reflection of, of white privilege. Um, yeah. I hadn't really thought of it until now, but that, but yeah, I think that might be, you, you might've just spurred on some insight there. Well, if, if Bear can provide more insight on that great insight, uh, but I, I want to go back. I've, I've heard that, but I've never really heard it articulated that way. The, the idea that uh, Satan Satan's going to get you, but not in the afterlife. Is, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I'm not really sure how to ask this because I, I, I really just found it fascinating. Are you saying that much of the black community, and I know you do speak for all black people because you are black and that is your burden to bear, your cross to bear. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, that 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 Satan is more interested in hell on earth than the hereafter. Like, is there a hell where you get punished after, or just if you live a dark lifestyle, a bleak lifestyle, it's because you have Satan? I, 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 the, the personification of Satan I found very interesting, and I. I mean, all right. Well, first, let, let me say this: I am not in by any means a Christian scholar, and I spent a lot less time in church than I spent running the streets, you know, playing music and doing other shit, right? But, so I'm not an authority on the quote unquote black church, right? Here's what I do know from the, the time I spent there. There was very little talk of hell. I can't remember a single time when the preacher said you will burn in hell like I got from the Christ, from the Catholic Church, right? Because right. I spent years in Catholic school, and there, there was a lot. There was no talk of the devil. There was literally like there was never any talk of Satan as being like a real thing. But there was talk of hell as being a real thing where you would go, right? Mm -hmm. And then I went, and then I did. I spent five years as a musical director at the Reformed Church in Wyckoff, New Jersey. Shout out to Wyckoff, New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I couldn't tell you the exact differences, but but they were. It was an affluent community, and much well, so of what you said, like, Nathan. I is I, I hear of like Unitarian churches, where it's like yeah. every, every religion that comes after one before usually says the one before me got this one wrong, so we're going to change it a little bit and go this way. Absolutely. And from what I'm getting from Andrew and what I've seen is you have these affluent churches that go, you know what? Bible's wrong on gays. Uh, gays are cool. Right. Well, is right. form anything along that way where it was like a more open sort of nice guy? It was, guy definitely, it was definitely a bit more open. It, I mean, they were definitely conservative, you know, to a degree, to a large degree, they were conservative. I was in the Genesis section, which was what they called the kind of, I'll say 45 and under. 40 and under people like they wanted young couples like couples with children who were not going off to college mm -hmm. you know what i mean like right away they wanted the kids they wanted to so we played there was like we were doing like u2 songs with jesus lyrics it's not really but like if you ever saw the south park where they said you know just take yeah. the hit songs and like it was like all the songs were kind of like the funny YouTube thing is you don't have to change u2 songs to make them be about right. jesus they <laughs> are anyway. i know sure. it's funny well, I like, really like like they all all the songs sounded like U two B sides that wouldn't have made into an album, but yeah. in another world or hits. A lot of them were some great songs. Like by the time I got out of it, the songwriting was at a all different level. But but those people, but they they never talked about hell, and they never talked about the devil, not once. And I actually even asked the pastor, I was like, "You guys just that's not even a thing here. This hell devil thing." And they're like, he was just like. What do you mean? Like, 
why would we ever talk about that stuff? Like, no, like because they talk about it's in the lives. Bible. That's why right. he's there. Right. Jesus <laughs> talks to him in the wilderness. Right. It's in the book. That's why you talk about him. Right. That's yeah. the that's the Baptist in me talking. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's a different thing. I mean, yeah, like like I feel like black people think of Satan as something you need to protect yourself from. You know what I mean? Like this kind of like Satan is the embodiment of all the bad influences in of it, that would come into your life. Like mm -hmm. people trying to pull you down the path to no good. They're all just Satan's agents, essentially. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's that's uh, again, uh, you know, maybe some of my my black friends who were, grew up in church come jump in on this in the comment section or something. But like you know, that's what it seemed to me that that they're just. Like all that, like get behind me, Satan type stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's that's what made I me think of uh, Albert Brooks and defending your life. Actually, you know, like mm -hmm. there's no hell, but I understand Los Angeles is getting kind of close. Like <laughs> the suffering we have is here on Earth. Why would we, you know, this this is where we are. This is where we exist. So this is where we're going to suffer. So why not lead the best life you I, can? That's, but here. I think that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Hmm. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that a handful of people are going to heaven and yeah. the rest of us get paradise on earth. And, uh, and, yeah. Which is a bit, it's a bit 40 virgin-y to me. I got to be honest with you. It's well, I'm, a bit I'm okay with that. If paradise on earth isn't heaven, and but it's paradise, I'm fine with that. I love Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses. They used to come to my door. And I remember full well, two years ago, a couple of them after 10 minutes kind of running out of shit to say to me, and then admitting, like, you know, nobody ever talks to this, us this long. I'm like, I'll talk to you. I don't care. Like, they, they, they were kind of stymied because they're so used to having the door closed in their face. Yep. Yeah. Well, you got to give Jehovah's Witnesses credit because they're actually mono monotheists. They do not think Jesus is God. They are not Trinitarians because, because Catholics, Protestants, we're pretty much, or they, however you want to call Christians, <laughs> mainline Christians, they are polytheist monotheists because they believe in the you know three gods in one kind of thing but but jehovah's witnesses on the other hand they do not believe jesus is god they are hardcore mono monotheists like uh yeah. jewish religion and just like islam islam i was just gonna say that's islam is every i, I know so many christians that get confused that say uh, islam is wrong islam is whatever i'm like you you do realize that you're all worshiping the same god the the jews Christians and, and, and Muslims worship the same God. You just have different paths to get there. And in the Quran, Jesus is a huge figure. He, yeah. He's like the Harry Potter of the Quran. <laughs> they don't say that he is God. They, 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 they don't worship Jesus. He's, he's a guy. He's, listen to him. But he's but one God, of the prophets. Right. Yeah, he's, he's a problem. And, and he's one of and it's interesting when, when they get so mad at Islam, it's like you're worshiping the same God. They don't have like this heathen God. It's the same God as yours, which makes the uh, the the Crusades really interesting, like big battles and fights to see who can worship the same God better. <laughs> okay, you know, or the Inquisition for that matter. It's like it's all the same God. It's 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 you know a lot a lot of these religious wars are um, like I said, religion being poured on an already pre existing conflict and just making it worse. Uh, you know, the Pope. Basically, I think it was Pope Urban who declared crusade, basically told the crusaders, told anyone, if you're going to fight the infidel in Jerusalem, it doesn't even matter if you get there, but you will be forgiven of all of your sins. Just because you tried? It doesn't even matter what kind of crazy stuff you do on the way, you will mm -hmm. still be forgiven. So you can see how that made a bad situation worse. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you said something, uh, th this sparked a, a memory in me that, that Barrett will probably like. Um, I, I think, Andrew, you'll like it too, but um, it, it really has no home, so I'm going to just throw it, lump it in here. There's no segue to it. You said you were a Baptist, or you were raised Baptist. I oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, what, what kind of Baptist? Uh, uh, we were what? not the treasonous Baptists. I always like pointing to that. That's out. what you said last week. Yes, you're... <laughs> Barrett, I, uh, my college roommate, the first year, freshman year, his father was a Southern Baptist yeah. minister. And uh, those are traitors, what we call. Yes. Uh, in the <laughs> North, at least what I call. They're just traitors. 
<laughs> I was raised secular. I've already said, I don't know the difference between any of the religions. I, I The Christian religions, like I get the difference between Judaism and Islam, uh, but I, I don't understand the difference between the Christian religions, how they all, whatever. Um, so I was raised secular. And uh, I, I, which means I didn't know anything about any religion at the time. And uh, Barrett and I are, my, my friend Roy, my, my roommate, our friend Roy uh, is getting married and oh. his, he's, he's an atheist and his father is a Baptist minister and he's marrying a Jewish woman. And I'm trying to think. Saucy. What's that? Saucy. That's an interesting yeah. sauce there. It's an interesting, interesting mix. So we go to West Virginia to, for the wedding. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know if this is Barrett. Maybe you can jump in. I don't know if this is at the rehearsal dinner. I think it was the wedding. I th I'm pretty sure it was the ceremony. And everyone hates me because I'm me. No. Okay. Because well, he and, shaved uh, his head into a mohawk. And he was like standing in the guy's wedding party. And wait, 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 I went to the rehearsal dinner with a full head of hair and a beard. Yeah. And then the next morning showed up for the wedding day with a mohawk right. and a goatee. Savage. Right. Exactly. Savage. So, a strong statement, sir. Know, a strong they statement. They didn't like me from the get-go. I think I think my my <laughs> toast at the at the rehearsal dinner had a lot to do with it. I gave a toast at the rehearsal dinner that did I give a speech at the wedding too, or did that get shit canned after my toast? Oh, it doesn't matter. So everyone hates me because I'm me and uh, I, I'm trying to win people over. Like, I, I want to be nice, you know, like I'm not going to fawn, but I'm trying to be nice. And people are filing in. The, it was the ceremony. It wasn't the dinner. People are filing into the ceremony. And they're, they're splitting bride side, groom side, bride side. And, and as I said, uh, it's, it's a Jewish uh, woman that he's marrying. And I see under a table a box and it's open. And I just see in the box, I'm like, oh, shit. That that's important. That's important. And and I and I run out and I, I'm looking around and I see the the bride's father, a very stern Jewish man. And I go, hey, uh, I just wanted to let you know, people are filing in and sitting down, but uh, there's a box of beanies under a table. You might want to put those out so people can put their beanies on. <laughs> and he just looked at me and went, those are yamakas, and walked off. And I'm like, I didn't know what the fuck they're called. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> He was super pissed at me for yeah. calling beanies yamakas. <laughs> I'm just like, dude, don't be a dick. I don't know what they are. I'd never heard of a yamaka. I just knew it was that little thing you put on right, your right, 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 right. Nice. That's funny, dude. That's funny. Is there anything else you remember from that, Barrett? But I just thought you might get a kick oh, out boy. of that. I remember you hanging out with your weenie hanging out at the at the at the fitting. Fuck you! I did not. That still pisses me off to this day. Oh, I'm so angry about that. You, you let your penis hang out. Is this? <laughs> this is an absurd story. So Barrett and I are standing in the wedding. I'm the best man. We're he's a groomsman. We show up and we call Roy, and Roy says, "Go straight to the uh, haberdashery to get fitted for your tuxedo." We go there. And uh, Barrett goes in to get fitted and I go, we get our things going and I come out and I go, Hey, my pants are too big. And I put my hands up. It drops like this much. And you can see what the, 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 my underwear, like uh, the, the band of my underwear, you can see the right. band of my underwear. And that's all I remember. That's literally all I remember. She's like, okay, I'll take it in. And then we leave and go to where Roy works. We, first thing we do is go straight to the, the tuxedo. We go to where Roy works. So like, okay. And he goes, well, you sure make a fine. This is why Barrett's dad hated me. I forgot. Not Barrett's dad. What am I saying? Why Roy's dad hated me. Um, so we, we, we go to where Roy works. And he goes, well, you made a, fir a fine first impression. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, my dad. I'm like, I, I haven't met your dad yet. He's like, he was at the tailors. I'm like... Why didn't he say hi? He's like, because you were walking around with your dick out. I'm like, what are you talking about? And apparently Roy's dad had said, I came out of the, the fitting room with my dick out going, woo, Mike, you can see my dick. Or whatever the story was, or that I was half naked with my pants on. I told him, I'm like, I dropped my pants. Like, and I said, they're too big. And he's like, well, you and 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 that was it. Like his dad had it in for me. I'm like, what kind of fucking asshole is this guy? Like both dads are just fucking cunts and yeah. it was insane that 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 me 
showing this much of my underwear to show the pants are too big equated to me having my dick out. I so, mean, you yeah. do know that both fathers are watching there. But one guy's a minister and the other guy's Jewish. And they're watching, the minister's watching his atheist son marry a Jewish woman. Yep. You know, I bet yeah. he, might have to, he might have been a little bit tense. <laughs> I think there's a lot going on in both of them. <laughs> and, and Roy, the, 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 the girl, I can't even remember her name. I'm going to tell you something shocking. Ended in divorce. Oh, um, yeah. Didn't, didn't work out. But she she was very she was a very nice proper Jewish girl as I remember I I, I enjoyed her very much as a person and and, and Roy nice guy uh, you know atheist musician long hair down his back uh, yeah. you know devil may care rebel so yeah the the Jewish father was probably <laughs> might might have I mean, been a little I mean weird. again I'm here. making assumptions I don't know any of these people I don't know well, I couldn't I, pick Roy's dad out of a lineup if you paid me you know what I mean. But I, if, if if you ask me what her father looked like, I would say Lee Van Cleef, but uh, that could just uh, be making something up. <laughs> Lee Van Cleef, awesome. That's that's what I remember. Is just sort of Lee ball. Van Cleef in a yarmulke. <laughs> Did he have a pocket watch? I don't remember. <laughs> oh man, you guys are funny. Um, all right, so back to is there a god or not? Probably not. <laughs> Well, we let, let's shift a little bit. We talked about this last week, but we had to rush off because of time constraints and we don't have any. Um, we talked about karma a bit, and I, I thought we were going down an interesting path before we had to go. And I state for the record that I don't believe in karma. I just, I, I would, it's, it's like, the, I would like to, I would like to believe if I do something good, then something good will happen to me. And I told a story and I'll tell it again. Um, I was asked to do a charity show and uh, a, a guy had, was diagnosed with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and they need money as big medical bills. And I said, absolutely. Uh, and, and I've been quarantined. I haven't done comedy in forever. Let me come donate my time and make your people laugh. And it was your friends and family and whoever's coming out to the show. And it was a great time. And I loved it. And, and I felt good just because I felt good because I did something good. I did not say yes because, ooh, this is good karma for me. I did not feel good because ooh, now, now something's good's gonna happen to me. I just felt good because I did good and that's the end. And then the next week I got pretty fucked over by ironically a religious group. Um, and I'm like, see, life is just random. There is no karma, there is no debt. You got screwed over because you did the charity event? No, 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 it's completely separate, okay. completely separate. I got fucked over by a religious uh, a professional group that that uh, is comedy related anyway uh i've actually signed a non-disclosure form so i can't even talk about it now uh, oh wow look yeah. at you being look, all my first non-disclosure like uh, like you will not acknowledge this production company you will not uh, talk about this uh, production company you will not mention them by name i'm like well, this is neat this is uh, what uh epstein's victims or weinstein's victims probably felt like when they were signing as employees um you can't even talk about the leaky ass. The what? The leaky <laughs> ass. I the, missed something. The leaky ass. You can't even talk oh. about the leaky ass. Can't talk about anything. Okay. But all of that said, all of that said, I, I kind of want to believe in karma because when there's a Trump flotilla and a bunch of boats sink, then I sort of go, well, see, maybe, you know, maybe there's karma where, you know, Poseidon, God of the seas went, okay. Fuck I, I'm gonna uh, that, that, that might just be proof of stupidity. It is, but that's where I say I, I'd be neat if it was karma. So that, that's where I stand on karma. I don't believe in it, but I kind of wish it was real because. What I mean. well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on a show in a, uh, on next Tuesday. And it's going to be about Hinduism because a lot of the, of our ideas about about Kama, you know, stem from uh, Hinduism uh, from, and, sub, from from the subcontinent. And you know, in that way, karma is a complicated way of blaming the victim and keeping people in their places. Yeah. And what it is is that if you have a horrible disease right now, or if you're out of luck or something horrible happened to you, well, it's because you did something in your previous life, so you kind of deserve it. Yeah. If you're in a position that you have no power in society and someone's bullying you, I'm sorry, that's just how it runs. Better luck next time. 
that is in your next life. So I think it's 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 a toxic idea um, in that way. Now, now our normal kind of new agey, wavy, gravy idea about karma. Yeah, you know, I mean, who wouldn't want to believe that people will get what they deserve? I, I just don't see any evidence for it. No, but, same. But, but, I, I would, but, but, go ahead, Eric. I have nothing. Uh, I don't know that I believe in karma as some kind of universal force, but I do think of of the. Uh, I feel like when you can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. My the the computer keeps talking to me for some reason. Um, <clears throat> I feel like when when people do bad things over time. They generally lead unhappy lives. I know people who, I think I said this last time, and you said, well, you know, plenty of people who do bad things and sleep at night, right? Sleep like and babies. Think, and I'm sure that they do. My question is, other than the money, what is the, like, if we take the money out of it as a metric for success or for mm -hmm. karma, right? Are they, ha do they have happy relationships with their spouses, their children, their co-workers, and people like that. Because most of the people I know who are ultimately not good people, no, they're, all their friends are like them too, which means they're always stabbing each other in the back, and they don't really like each other that much. And most of them have really shitty relationships with their romantic partners, and many of them have shitty relationships with their children. And you know, their family, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I and I know that's you, like, I, you know, I might be biased to this, but, uh, you know, I just, okay, let me back up. I, I believe that there are some people who are happy, right? They're sure. just, they have a genetic predisposition towards being happy and wow. fictitious God bless them. That's great. All the more power to you. <laughs> I just think most of us are just on some kind of sliding scale of miserable, um, <laughs> struggling. I, I, I disagree, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, you're you're the positive one, I guess. <laughs> I wouldn't say the sliding scale of misery. What I I think I think happy. Uh, Billy Joel said this. Someone said, "Oh, you're rich and famous. You must be happy." And he's like, "Happy's an extreme. Sad yeah. is an extreme." I think most of us are just in the middle. Now that I agree with. I wouldn't say misery, but I'd say just just level. You know, with with with, with an extreme on either side of happy or sad. Okay, okay, well, I'll I'll give you that. But let's say you know I haven't seen any peer reviewed research that have that has shown that there is a uh, any kind of relationship between doing quote unquote i don't know evil stuff and we can figure out we we can we can define what evil stuff is and what it isn't um and i haven't seen any kind of research that says that the more evil you are the less happy you are i haven't seen that what i have seen is that hitler liked dogs and he seemed to really like dogs um, up until the time that that um, Allied bombs started falling on Germany, there were a lot of happy freaking Nazis, basically, um, mm -hmm. and living their best lives or what they considered to be their best lives. So, you know, like like I said, uh, uh, it's a very tenuous relationship with how moral, quote unquote, moral a person is and how how um, fulfilled they are in life. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I like that. I wouldn't say that we could decide, you said we could give a definition of evil because I don't think we can, because right now there not there aren't, but people there are people out there that will watch this and say, We are evil for even questioning God or yeah, yeah. you know, so so evil is definitely a sliding scale of of uh, whatever you want it to be. Yeah, yeah, true. But you know, I mean, in, in a scientific way, you could you could just make up. I mean, you could just say, well, this is how we define yeah. evil, right? And you could say define you could define evil as just being some kind of version of narcissism, some kind of malignant form of narcissism, where and but even that, you know, part of the definition would make you un. Well, I don't know. You know, now I'm trying to 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 work this out well, in <clears throat> on, on on camera, but you know, you could. If you're narcissistic, I've known a lot of narcissistic people and they are happy. They are just, they're like, yeah. like really happy people. But, I mean, and they, would you argue that that's a psychological disorder? 
you know, coming from, you know, how you see the play is where you're sitting. Yeah, definitely. From what I, <laughs> where, where I am, it's like, dude, you are messed up. Yeah. Right. But but you know, crazy, but, right? but 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 so, in there. But but if the but if they're in sales or they're lawyers or they're in a or they're in a job that kind of rewards this kind of narcissism, then you know that they they just found something. They they, they just found a right. way to make it work. They just oh. monetize their narcissism. Exactly. Yeah. And they're yeah. happy. Right. They're happy people. Like I think I think Joel Osteen is probably very happy. And if you want to talk evil, I I think he's evil in a in a very interesting way hardcore but, evil guy hardcore evil as far as uh i don't know how this relates to karma i really don't but uh, barrett i think you said something we, we which said we, we we equate uh success with wealth yes and i know not well, not personally really maybe but I, i've read a million stories million celebrity stories where they were complete assholes, cutthroat assholes to make it to the top of their profession. And once they got there and they were rich, they realized they weren't happy. So then they're like, oh, now I'm going to focus on me. And they became good people. And so, you know, they weren't punished karmically for being assholes. They did make it to their top of their game. And then they're like, oh, well, now I get to work on me because, you know, I don't have the stress of a, a daily job or I don't have to worry about unemployment well, or I can I can do yoga all day or I can hire a nanny to take care of my kids. And then they became uh, better people. No, no retribution for the people they hurt and fucked over along the way to be successful. So, I mean, yeah, I mean that, but, okay. but I mean, I get But to me, this comes down to. One, how we defined it, much like what you said, where, you know, where you sit in the play depends on your, you know, your perception makes a lot of difference, right? Mm -hmm. Because here's what I'll say. When I was the kind of guy who would show up and kind of be somewhat unprepared and not have my shit together and dudes would come in and really hold me to task, I think they were assholes and I think they were being mean. And when they went on to be successful later, I'd say, that guy's an asshole and you got to be an asshole to make it, right? And then I started to really get my shit together and then hold other people to task when they didn't. And I realized I became that asshole. I became the asshole I used to be. And I realized in being that guy, I was like, well, this guy isn't an asshole. He's just a guy who doesn't want to waste his fucking time. And he's not trying to waste his time with people who aren't really about shit. And if yeah. I'm not really about shit, he's not really going to, you know what I mean? Like if these people go on to become really famous and other people go on it's not because they're assholes. Right. It's because they have a certain place in which they see their value as being worth more than the situation they're a part of. And I could get that how that there's a thin line between that and narcissism. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, there's yeah. a place in which you actually are overqualified for something. And then there's a place where you think you're overqualified for something. Right. But, and there's yeah. a place where you refuse to tolerate less than you think you're worth. And there's a place where that comes off, or comes across like being a dick. But sure. there is a line there. Do you know what I mean? Does that make yeah, sense? Well, you know, this goes back to the whole, you know, the Trump rally up with the boats and everything about wanting to be, <laughs> you know, wanting there to be comic. But when I said, well, what there is is that there's evidence for stupidity. And, and I just want to bring it back here is like when you figure out the system of how to be successful, that might create dickish like qualities. Or what yes. other people may may create dickish like qualities, but what you're doing is that you're not, you know, for lack of a better word, you're not being as stupid as you were before. And, and so once again, you know, it's it's evidence that intelligence works, hard work, hard work counts. Uh, stupidity generally is bad, uh, but <laughs> is it evidence for karma? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm inclined to agree with you guys. I will say. It's one of those floaty thoughts that I got to grab it fast and it's already half gone. Um, let's we'll see if I can grab it again. There's something, ah, two things. One, <clears throat> Hitler, Germany, religion. What Hitler did functioned just like a religion, but it wasn't a religion, right? So in that sense is God or religion the problem or is some kind of mass hypnotic bullshit the problem that and then and uh, let me couple that with this question which is it seems like if what we're trying to do is to, to oh, god damn it 
<laughs> I, I, words are such an imperfect medium for thoughts. And, and like, I get, I like that. I yeah, like that a lot. Like, I have this idea and I can't get it out through my mouth. Oh, I, I, I will say a few you things. Trying to say through interpretive dance. Can you oh, yeah. and let your yeah. ideas flow through you in a way that everyone will understand? <laughs> or maybe can you quick whip up a song? <laughs> there you go. Go get your bass token. I know you have one. <laughs> God damn it, Cartman. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> anyway, what were you going to say, Andy? <laughs> you know, uh, one of my my uh, points I like to rant off about, and I'm not going to do it now because I'm in control of myself. But when you think about Nazism and its relationship with, with religion, is that Germany, we'll go back to the first crusade, what we were talking about, you know, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes ago, when crusaders were going through Germany on their way to the Holy Land, they figured out, they came to the very logical conclusion that, well, we're going like a thousand miles to go fight the infidel, but there are infidels here, Jews. Let's take care of them now on our way. Um, you know, so yeah, Nazism, it, it, Nazism is directly related to the anti-Semitic philosophy teachings of both Catholicism and Lutheranism up until the second Vatican Jews were blamed for the death of Christ. Uh, the Pope created ghettos, you know, Pope's created ghettos for Jews. Uh, Martin Luther, the creator of Lutheran, of the Lutheran faith hated Jews. And that was, you know, started off in Germany, in Northern Germany. Um, so, and when, when Germans thought, when the Nazis thought about, oh, how do we persecute Jews? They took some pages from Luther's handbook of I hate Jews and said, <laughs> well, let's um, burn down their temples. Let's, you know, rout them from their homes and yeah, this is all Googleable stuff. This is just not the crazy atheist guy saying it. Is that Martin Luther, the creative Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran faith, hated Jews and went out of his way to to persecute them. And once again, that's just based on Catholicism too. It's an offshoot of Catholicism, and and Catholicism was anti-Semitic for a very long period of time. Let me let me take what Barrett said and tie it to something you said, Andrew, a while ago. That uh, you know, Vermont is more peaceful than Mississippi. When people at their worst, that's when they latch onto things more. I mean, that that gave rise to Nazism. Is after yep. World War One, Germany had the shit kicked out of it, and yep. instead of like the Marshall Plan after World War Two, said, okay, uh, kicking them when they were down didn't work after World War One. After World War One, one was over. It was all right. You fucking started this shit you're paying for everything. Yes, exactly. Germany could not get out of that. So Hitler comes yeah. along and says, hey, we're Germans, we're proud, fuck those guys. Yeah. And uh, you know, people are like, yeah, they, they've been picking on us. You know, what did we ever do? Conveniently forgetting World War I. But, um, you know, so that <laughs> gave rise to Nazism is, is the fact that, you know, we kicked them while they were down and he gave them a sense of pride and created a cult. That this they is true. When they were desperate, that's why. And it's really up to our credit to how we treated both the Germans, Western yeah. Europe, and the Japanese. Give them, um, give them back on their feet. Non, we we yeah, we, we did not persecute them. Um, we gave them Marshall, we gave them the Marshall Plan, helped them rebuild their societies. Um, yeah, as against to World War One, which we just, which is a horrible thing. So, you know, kicked them when they were down, like you were saying. Yeah. Well, I mean, anything uh, we haven't yeah, covered that anyone wants well, to touch yeah, on? So I got one more question. Here's an interesting sure. thing. Something you said, Andy, earlier about what led you to this place. One of the things that I found interesting about that, aside from my humidifier being full. I was going to say, someone okay. <laughs> was, was uh, carbon yeah. monoxide poisoning. Which one right. of us is going to pass out? I hear beeping. Right. Um, but, <laughs> but this is one of those things, like, when we talk about the kind of birth of this nation no pun intended with the movie, even though they kind of looked exactly the same. Um, the, there's a kind of thought narrative that many of the kind of black intellectuals have been 
running with that said, like, if we don't deal with this, I mean, as well as like 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago in the 70s, if we don't deal with this whole kind of racial issue, there's going to be a reckoning because this country is built on all these kinds of lies and that is going to lead to a place that is going to look like, and then after Germany, people said, look, this place is going to get to that. And many of the black intellectuals said that, and kind of nobody really listened. So my question is, how did you come to this place of kind of being able to see something that I can just remember in yeah. 2014 and 15 talking about what I would say is going to be the rise of white supremacists, and now that's going to be, they're going to be these horrible terrorists and going to be some of the things, and, and there's kind of like an inability to see that kind of wrapped up in this religious fervor. So I'm curious how you got to a place where you saw something that kind of a whole bunch of other people, it seems obvious to me, but I have a different sure. perspective. So how did you come to that perspective? Right, right. You, you, well, to, to, to answer that is that, it, you know, I, I, I have an interest in history. So I consider myself somewhat educated in history. I've had a fascination with the fall of uh, the Weimar Republic, which was the republic in between um, World War One and World War Two in Germany. I read a bunch of books on it when I was a kid. And also being a comedian, being a comedian means being an outsider to some extent. And so when you're always, when you're an outsider, you're, you're always looking, you're always looking at what's going on. And, um, so I think those helped inform my opinions on how the country was going. And, and, you know, atheists are a religious minority too. And so that helped inform how I saw things also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting shit. I can't figure out how to turn my credit back on right now. So uh, instead of me sitting here typing while you guys talk, do, we, do you want to put a cherry on this and see uh, hopefully that it yeah. goes over well, like you said? Fun. This is uh, good shit, fellas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this was fun. fun. I had to get uh, apologize for my yeah. awkward departure. But as, before she even started uh, hammering, I, I was saying, like, oh, you know, we've been doing this a little over an hour. Let's try and wrap it up. But uh, Andrew, quick, uh, Barrett, I will say, is at antargoodwin.com, musical director for the Katie Henry Band. Uh, I am at nathantimmel.com. I am the comedic director for Nathan Timmel. And then, uh, Andrew, plug yourself. At so Laugh you can find me. My blog is Laughing in Disbelief. It's on the Pathos non-religious channel. I have a YouTube channel. That's with the same name, Laughing in Disbelief. I do all kinds of fun and chaotic things there, too. You can find me in those two locations. And, I'm, you know, of course, I'm on Twitter, too, at Laugh Purgatory. Well, there <laughs> thanks for uh, Thanks for hanging with us, Andrew. Had yeah, a blast, guys. Fun, Had a blast. Yeah, man. Uh, let's do this yeah. a third time. Uh, yeah. And hopefully it'll be the second time we actually record and it works, not yes. if one suddenly fails for no reason. I'm, I'm going to go over here and click end broadcast yep. and hopefully it all.